pleasure to uh, welcome you to the very first of our Gold Room Lecture Series and to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Tori Young. Uh, Dr. Tori Young over here, is a, a principal lecturer at, at uh, Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. She is currently writing a monograph entitled Universal Love, 21st Century Love Stories, which I think uh, has some connection to what she'll be talking to us about today. Uh, she is editing a special edition of Textual Practice on queer and feminist theories and narratives. Uh, and she has also written about the authors Nancy Cunard, Hope Mirlees, Cohn Toybin, and uh, Ali Smith. She is also the author of Cambridge University Press's Studying English Literature, A Practical Guide, which is uh, uh, well read on both sides of the Atlantic, so you may be familiar with it. Uh, but uh, for now, I will hand over to a much more interesting speaker than myself and a fantastic topic. <laughs> I've, uh, I heard a, a little bit of this, uh, I heard a version of this paper last summer, and I very selfishly wanted to uh, have another chance to, to hear it, but I hope you will all be the beneficiaries of that uh, impulse. So uh, I'll pass over to Tori, who will be talking to us about risky business, love and London in contemporary writing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really joyful to be here, uh, uh, to see you all, and to be talking about love in a room with cherubs, <laughs> appropriately, on the ceiling. So um, you've all come over, many of you have come over uh, to, to the UK for um, your education, for learning, for adventure, and maybe even a bit of love. I don't know. The, the, the formal title of my paper, someone's shaking their head, like, no way. Uh, <laughs> Risky Business, Love and London and Contemporary Writing. That's the formal uh, title. The, the more informal title could be How to Find True Love. Yep, that's what I'm going to tell you. Or, yeah, or, and I'm giving it for free as well. Or, uh, How True Love Might Find You. Um, I'm, oops, mustn't forget about my slides. Uh, I'm going to um, talk under kind of five headings. Uh, I'm, I'm, the, 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 the term risky business really comes from um, a philosopher, Alan Badger, whose work, he wrote a book called In Praise of Love, and it connected to some of the reading I'd been doing of uh, contemporary women's writing about love. So I'm going to sort of start the paper, the first half perhaps, is going to be sort of thinking about Alan Badger's worries and fears about the dating scene. Um, and uh, so the first sort of uh, few titles relate to his book. And he uh, makes a division between true and enduring love in life and then uh, love in art, the kind of love that's celebrated in art. So I'm going to set up these terms. Then I'm going to um, give you a few kind of case studies from um, some contemporary writing. I'm using the term chiclet here. Uh, it, it has been seen as a derogatory term. Um, it's still, I think, a useful term. It's perhaps a little bit of a dated term now, actually. I'm not sure that people use it in quite the same way. Um, but I'm going to talk about, about chick lit, about uh, popular women's writing for women. And I'm also going to talk about uh, contemporary sort of dating memoirs in newspapers and online. And I'm going to conclude um, just to show how we absorb some of these conventions and how um, they bring us to certain expectations about love and narrative in these um, popular novels. So this is um, Alan Badger's In Praise of Love. In 2008, um, Badger was invited by um, Nicholas Truong, the organizer, to participate in a theater of ideas at the Avignon Festival. And In Praise of Love, this is what Alan Badger decided to write about, to talk about rather, and this book 
is really um, just the, the publication of this conversation that happened in this uh, festival in 2008. Now, it happened to be held on Bastille Day, 14th of July, um, which has all sorts of connotations, um, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. But first of all, I wanted to just say that um, if you look at reviews of Alan Badger's In Praise of Love, um, uh, everyone likes this book, but some of them doubt its um, hardcore philosophical structure, let's say. And one critic I found, and I don't know if this is a slightly sexist comment, but anyway, one critic I found, um, an Australian critic, says of the book, retaining the spontaneous flavour of such an exchange, the theses of this striking popular book can be immediately absorbed even by the idle reader. I'm sorry to say this, a friend of mine remarked while flipping through my proof copy, but this sounds a little like the sort of thing your grandmother would say. So, um, you know, maybe you feel that Badger's ideas are very much like what your grandmother would say. Certainly, there's a degree of prevalence. Um, it, I, I'm going to suggest that the ideas that he's talking about are prevalent. Um, and uh, that may well mean they're what your grandmother might say. Um, I'm not really going to talk about um, uh, Badgers. I'm kind of removing his uh, discussion of the army and the military because I'm, I'm focusing on love. Um, but, but the impetus um, for, the, for, the, for the conversation um, is as described here. Badger said, I was excited by the idea of celebrating love a cosmopolitan, subversive sexual energy that transgresses frontiers and social status at a time normally devoted to the army, the nation, and the state. So he says it's going to be a celebration, as the, as the title suggests, but the very first chapter of the elaborated text is called Love Under Threat, and it sees love as threatened by the commercial enterprise whose adverts dominate the city of Paris. Badger describes himself as really disturbed by posters for Meetic, which is an international, uh, sorry, an internet dating site. So these posters um, are plastered all around Paris. Um, and uh, Badger perceives um, that they offer a safety-first concept of love, comprehensively insured against all risks. You will have love, but will have assessed the prospective relationship so thoroughly, will have selected your partner so carefully by searching online, by obtaining, of course, a photo, details of his or her tastes, date of birth, horoscope, sign, etc. And putting it all in the mix, you can tell yourself, this is a risk-free option. That's their pitch. That's the internet dating site's pitch. And he says, backed as it is, with all the resources of a wide-scale advertising campaign, I see it as the first threat to love, what I would call the safety threat. So he has this argument that by putting in all these Com sort of computational details and information about what you want and who you are, that you're removing the risk um, from uh, the, the encounter, which will end up in producing true love. He doesn't think that you can have true love without risk. And he thinks that dating sites are removing the risk and the chance which will, which will lead to that. So let's have a look at some of these posters which frightened Badger so much. Um, I should just also say that uh, when I looked it up recently, um, it, it, it was very, it, one of the first things that comes up if you look up Meetic after the actual site itself is an uh, article saying um, that it has been now um, uh, uh, listed as a, as a um, I can't quite think what the phrase is, it's gone from my head, um, that they're selling the shares, that it is a phenomenally successful um, uh, business. Um, so it's slightly kind of supporting Badger's concerns about it as being a, a, a marketing enterprise. <laughs> so here are the, here are the posters. Um, it's um, immediately, just by looking at the colours, 
we can see that it's um, sort of relying on uh, cliches about pink and blue. It seems to be immediately heterosexual. And if you look at the, um, again, on the website, under the other services, there is um, an affiliated um, dating direct gay site. So it seems to be a conventional um, heterosexual um, uh, uh, campaign. And um, I'm just going to explain um, what these actually say. So um, I'm, I'm not going to try and uh, say them in French, because I've got the worst French uh, pronunciation in the world. It's terrible, um, for reasons I might explain later. Um, uh, here's the one that's aimed at the, the men, the blue one. And it says, uh, you might meet the woman of your life, the woman of your dreams, your true love, on the metro. Um, uh, if, in the, sorry, in the end, if she takes the metro. So um, the phrase, um, the femme de votre vie, the woman of your life, implies that there's only going to be one. And it's, it's going to take a long time. If, if, if she takes the metro, that's the, the, the Paris subway. So there's a, there's a great deal of... Um, uncertainty there that they're playing on, and they're suggesting that you can't afford to leave it to chance. And uh, the, um, the one um, directed for, for women says, says the same thing. You might meet the man of your, um, of your dreams, of your life, your true love, on this bus. Um, uh, uh, except if he doesn't take the bus. So, um, and there are a whole load of other ones which are all around the city saying things like, um, uh, you might meet the, the man of your dreams, uh, uh, except he might not take line 63 or whatever the actual line is. So, um, the, 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 the METIC is playing on this idea that uh, you can't afford to leave it to chance. You better sign up to METIC because it's just too risky to leave it to chance. You might not bump into your... Uh, true love, um, it, it's just too risky. What I want to talk about, though, really, is, um, and this is bad news for all of you who live in rural locations and who drive around in your own cars, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a good job you've come over and you can get down to London for the weekend. Because apparently, from my extensive reading, the way to find true love is that you, you well, the only way that you're going to find true love, let me put it a bit more strongly, is by, by in fact, bumping into them on the bus or the underground. It, it comes up so often, and I'm going to move on to give you examples later, but that is how people meet their true love in books, right? In fiction, on the bus or the underground. Maybe you might bump into them on the street in London, but that, those are the only ways you're ever going to meet your true love. Um, I had intended to bring with me a copy of Metro, the free paper which um, goes, is distributed on the un London Underground every weekday morning. Um, but they'd taken them all away, and it was time for the Evening Standard by the time I got here. But um, in that paper, um, there is a page every day called Rush Hour Crush. Mm -hmm. And what you do on, in Rush Hour Crush is, just to help this kind of along, because obviously you're going to meet your true love on the bus, or the, sorry, or the underground, you, you, you might feel a bit shy about approaching them. So what you need to do is you, there's, a, there's a website, and I can give it to you. It is uh, rushourcrush.metro.co.uk. And you say something like, um, woman who got on at Piccadilly Circus at 8.03 yesterday. Um, you had a lovely smile. Fancy a coffee? Or something like that. It, it's, so. so you're beginning to see that this is a very common idea. This is how you're going to meet, meet someone that you fancy. You're going to meet them on public transport. You're going to bump into them um, on public transport. And um, to help it along, you can, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, have a look at for everyone else's entertainment, I suppose, as well. Um, so. Um, Badger is worried 
that METIC is replacing all these chance encounters. And um, he's, he, as I said, he thinks that internet dating is like an arranged marriage. Not done in the name of family order and hierarchy by despotic parents, but in the name of safety for the individuals involved through advance agreements that avoid randomness, chance encounters, and in the end, any existential poetry due to the categorical absence of risks. So I'm kind of moving on to the second bit of my paper now about this idea of eliminating risk. Because it might seem anecdotally that the idea of using an internet dating site, um, the idea that that removes risk, that might seem counterintuitive. Because I think anecdotally, or maybe personally, um, we know that uh, it seems to be a very risky business to um, meet someone um, via the internet. The idea that, the, that it removes risk seems a bit strange. And um, one of the um, online dating blogs that I enjoy reading, um, although with my sort of teeth clenched, it's, it's quite excruciating, um, is uh, in The Guardian, um, which is a, a daily paper, um, but every Saturday there's a column um, by a, a woman who, who goes under the name of Stella Gray, and um, she's apparently a woman in her 50s, and it, her column is called Midlife Ex-Wife, and the column is about her, what she says, perhaps irrational hope of finding true love um, via online dating, and every week um, she explains some tortuous outcome of some uh, attempt at dating, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're terrible. They're just really awful. They're awful, awful stories. Some of them are really quite misogynistic, um, men who turn her down because she's got fat thighs or something. Um, some of them are, are just men who are online who want to send pictures of their penises. Um, <laughs> It, it, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to come back to Stella Gray, but anyway, um, it, it, it kind of goes on and on, and I can only admire her um, determination, really. Um, so, um, she certainly found it a risky business, but in fact, um, Badger does acknowledge this kind of risk, and he says um, that... Um, uh, is that... Uh, uh, the risk factor can never be completely eliminated. That's the quote on the left. Meetick's publicity says that the risks will be everyone else's. If you've been trained well for love, you won't find it difficult to dispatch the other person if they don't suit. If he suffers, that's his problem, right? And, and this is, in fact, what we see with Stella Gray, that she's on the other end. She is the, uh, the non, you know, the, it's the men who uh, are not having, it's not risky, it's risky for her, it's not risky for them. They're dispatching her when they don't, uh, when she doesn't appear to meet um, their criteria. So he's, he's saying um, that, uh, you, you know, you, you are still kind of removing the risk because if you still, even having gone through all these, um, you know, um, uh, giving all this information, if you still find um, that the person isn't appropriate, you just dispatch them without Im any emotional investment. Um, so, um, Badia's ideas um, are found uh, time and time again in um, what are these very, very popular online dating blogs. A lot of the, the newspapers have these online um, uh, these, these sections about um, people participating in online dating and all their experiences. And um, there was another one I've, I found, uh, a woman who is um, a, 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 an American Iranian from New York, a filmmaker called Desiree Akhavan. And um, she contributes to a site um, on The Guardian, again, talking about Tinder. I'm assuming that you know what Tinder is. Yeah. So um, she, she says, um, so th this, this, this quote comes from a particular post which was headed, it only took one uncomfortable encounter to make me realize the dating app has turned me into a teenage boy who never has to face the risk of rejection. 
And everything that she says supports Badia's thesis of traditional internet dating being like an arranged marriage, devoid of the risk that will lead to love. <laughs> she says, um, uh, 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 it's not that quote yet, don't get me wrong, I love Tinder. It's the great equalizer of modern dating. There's a straightforward cards on the table honesty and the tiniest bit of vulnerability to the fact that we're all hanging out in this virtual meat market. I find it a purer medium than more traditional dating sites such as OkCupid or Match.com. A friend equated the latter to having your parents set you up on a date because you two have so much in common. With Tinder, you can't over-intellectualize it. It's like being at a bar on your phone, whatever time of day you feel like it, with absolutely no risk of rejection. There's an enormous industry in um, not just the online dating sites, but um, TV programs, um, which, which are about kind of matching people up. Um, and it's interesting, one I've seen that is definitely also um, maybe originated in America is the one where um, people um, marry someone at, called Married at First Sight. Does anybody know that? <laughs> what? What? Why? Why? So one of the people in the, in the first, there's only been one British series of Married at First Sight and um, the uh, uh, what one couple who actually seemed, you know, like they might get on quite well. It, apparently, he, it, after they got married, straight away he went onto Tinder to find someone else. That's an aside. But anyway, in in the program, I mean, as if he didn't think he was going to be recognised. Um, he, one of them said, nobody expects to meet anyone in real life anymore. Um, people will be sitting in a bar on Tinder. So the idea that it's not people aren't on Tinder at home or something, they're actually sitting in the bar on Tinder. Uh, so, so maybe going against uh, um, uh, the idea that you're going to bump into someone on the bus, you're actually going to sit in a bar on Tinder and then maybe meet up with someone sitting next to you on Tinder in the bar. Anyway, that's a slight digression about Tinder. But uh, Akavan concludes, here's the problem. Earlier, I said what was great about Tinder was the lack of risk. Not having to face my crippling social phobia and fear of rejection is the appealing factor here. But what if risk is the one thing that makes meeting someone special? Perhaps by removing the risk, you bleed the experience of its most vital element, and that's why these encounters inevitably end up feeling disposable no matter how you approach them. So I'm going to move on um, to uh, Badia's um, um, discussion of love in, in books and love in life. But so far, what Akavan and, so, and the others have said entirely supports what he is saying. So um, it, 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 Badia, um, in, his, in his exploration, he, he draws on writers and poets to develop his concept of love. Um, but he finds that art, this is maybe surprising, he finds that art celebrates the transient and that it's life that contains the enduring love, the happy ever after that books conclude with but don't portray. And that's, that's rather nice, isn't it? I think we tend to think it's the other way around, that only in books do you find happy ever after. But in fact, he's saying, no, books celebrate the transient but it's in life that we have enduring love. Oh, it makes me feel really nice inside. Um, he says, important works, great novels are often built around the impossibility of love. It's being put to the test. It's tragedy, it's waning, it's separation, end, etc. But there is very little on it lasting positively. We could even say married life has hardly produced a great work. And this, this made me think immediately of um, Ian McEwan's novel, Saturday, which he wrote, uh, was published in 2005. And it's about, um, I read this on my honeymoon, appropriately enough, it's about a very happily married couple, 
But all the reviews, everyone was kind of making sick noises. Um, uh, uh, oh, it's so nauseating. Oh, it's so smug. Oh, it's writing about this couple who've been married for years and they still have sex and they still love each other. People hated it for that, that reason. So I think Badger's, you know, he, he knows what he's talking about. Other theorists like Laura Mulvey, film theorist, she's also written about the fact that we, what we like reading is about the obstacles to love. We don't want to read about um, enduring true love. So um, Badia says um, that uh, um, he's interested in issues of duration and process and not just starting points. And um, he, um, if anybody has ever read any Badia or wants to read any, you'll find that he's obsessed with this idea of the event. Um, so event means something very kind of important to him. He says... Um, love always starts with an encounter, and I would give this encounter the quasi-mythical status of an event, namely of something that doesn't enter into the immediate order of things. There are innumerable examples in art or literature that describe such a starting point for love. And um, he, he kind of goes on to talk about tenacity and the promise I love you means I shall extract something else from what was mere chance. So he's saying that, that the, the, the happy ending, the marriage at the end of the book, the statement of I love you, that's a, that's a promise of something enduring which has arisen out of chance. And uh, he, he kind of, you know... Um, he, he says that, that nothing enables one to prearrange the encounter. So even um, Meetic and all those long preparatory chats, in the end, the moment you see each other in the flesh, you can see each other, and that's that, and it's out of control. So he's making what seems, again, you know, this is like your grandma speaking, perhaps, um, what the critic meant. Um, it, it, if, if you can have all the chats in the world, you can email, email each other a million times, um, but when you meet each other, if you don't have that, that, that spark, that, that, that magic moment, it's, you know, dead in the water. Um, and this, this made me kind of return back to poor old Stella Gray, because um, last year she had um, spent a few weeks in the, in the, in the online blog um, detailing these long conversations, email conversations she had with um, this man and they thought they got on so well um, that they planned this whole day for their first meeting and then of course they met and um, that's, that's a little um, uh, at of all. Um, she, she says, uh, I found myself wondering if we'd always text each other these little endearments, even when we lived together. But this is somebody I hadn't even met yet. I joined him after his meeting outside a bistro, and our eyes met as I was threading my way through other pedestrians. I'd gone to a lot of effort. A mid-calf black dress with fat clamping panels had been purchased, and new black boots, and I'd had my hair done but his face registered disappointment that he struggled to hide. His appearance surprised me too. He was broader, greyer, and looked older than I was expecting. He looked weary and anxious. I'd assumed there'd be a romantic first contact, a kiss that would set the tone for the day. It felt like we'd already had a lengthy build-up to that. But the hug he offered me was formal. I stepped back and looked into his eyes. His cool blue eyes looked back. I looped an arm around his neck and kissed him on the mouth, a closed lip kiss, though not like a great aunt at Christmas kiss. He seemed surprised. He pulled away. We were five minutes into an itinerary involving lunch, strolling, drinks, theatre and dinner, and it already felt like a disaster. It was a disaster. Things were going to get worse. So... There she is again, supporting Badia's idea. You can apparently get on all, you know, as well as you like online, but then when you meet, you know, pff, might not work. So um, one of the books that um, Badia celebrates, um, or, or kind of 
uses to typify his celebration of love and how it happens is <clears throat> um, uh, a novel called Nadia um, by Andre Breton. Um, this is, um, was part of the Surrealist movement, the French Surrealist movement. And um, uh, Badger says, uh, the, the Surrealists had little interest in that which endured. Above all, they championed love as a magnificent poem of the encounter. For example, in Nadia, that's one of Nadia's drawings, which is a splendid illustration of the poetics of the uncertain and mysterious encounter that round the street corner will become l'amour fou, so crazy love. So Nadia, um, this, is a, this is a very problematic book. It is um, a very celebrated novel in, in France. It's by André Breton, the founder of um, uh, Surrealism. And um, it's, um, it's problematic because, for me anyway, um, if, if you read it as a kind of just a, a book which is celebrating love and Paris, it's OK. Unfortunately, the English translation um, in the introduction, it kind of spells out that this is based very much on real, um, a, a real encounter. Um, between Andre Breton, and he was married at the time, he bumped into Nadia around the street corner, and they had a kind of love affair which lasted for 10 days. And then uh, Andre Breton sort of said, uh, bye, Nad Nadia, I've had enough now, I'm going back to my wife or some other woman. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Nadia um, obviously suffered from mental health problems and was incarcerated. And uh, the, novel, the novel, the book, ends with him sort of musing on, um, oh, dear, isn't it terrible how mad people are treated? And if you read it, I find, if you read it as uh, knowing that this is real life, it's very, it does feel very... <coughs> very problematic because of his treatment of Nadia. But in France, it's um, uh, everybody loves it. Um, <laughs> and it, it, that, I, I think Simone de Beauvoir criticizes it in The Second Sex, actually. Um, uh, if, if, if you read it, you know, I, I wish that the translator had kind of removed that introduction, because I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure it is based in real life in that way. Anyway. This is the book, The Chance Encounter, The Crazy Love, that Badieu says that art celebrates, and it's the kind of uh, a moment which leads to enduring love and the poetics of the encounter. Um, and um, uh, I want to um, now turn to these contemporary fictions that I've been reading, which also seem to you know, sometimes even use the same kind of words about the round the street corner um, uh, way that you're going to meet your true love. And it's worth also sort of pointing out that um, although Badger doesn't, doesn't spell it out at all, um, if you're going to meet your true love around the street corner, it, it's an urban scene, isn't it? Uh, he's not saying you're going to bump into your true love uh, in a field. Um, so he, he celebrates the city, um, Badger, without quite realising it. And, and so does Nadia, that book celebrates Paris very much. So um, as a uh, narratologist, a narrative theorist, which I sort of am, <laughs> I'm interested um, in narrative structure. So when I'm reading um, uh, memoirs and fictions, chick lit, contemporary novels, I'm not so much interested in the difference between fact and fiction. I'm more interested in the ways that they um, are structured. And um, you would think that the difference between memoir, life writing, and fiction, um, chick lit novels and so on, you would think that the difference would be um, that life writing is kind of ongoing, um, less structured, but that the, the fiction that has, has a clearer kind of ending, a resolution. And you would expect, if you were reading chick lit in particular, or popular women's fiction, you would expect that the ending would very clearly be some kind of 
then they got it together. Um, happy ending, um, I love you, let's get married, something like that. Um, if you are interested in your studies um, about endings, um, Frank Commode, um, a critic, wrote a, a, a definitive work called The Sense of an Ending. Um, and he, he separates um, uh, these two types of texts um, into chronos and kairos. He uses um, these um, uh, uh, Greek terms. And um, chronos, he would use for this idea of the kind of ongoing text, which is more like, like life. And he, he identifies it to the tick, 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 tick of a clock. And then the alternative is kairos, um, which is uh, like um, uh, um, something which has a kind of ending, um, which is, goes, and the noise he associates that with is tick tock. So there's the ending. And um, one of them takes its meaning from the ending, and then the other is more sort of ongoing, and the, and the meaning inheres in each moment, in each page. So you're less interested in what happens at the end, um, but with the other, with, with, for instance, genre fiction, you're always thinking about what's going to happen at the end. You're working towards a marriage plot or a who did it, if it's a, a thriller or a crime fiction. Um, so you would sort of think that there would be a, a, a more clear distinction between the, the, the novel with its ending and the life writing, which, well, it's, it's working towards a certain ending, isn't it, uh, death? Um, but um, uh, if, it, if it's a memoir, you know, you haven't got there yet. Um, and this is, this is really what I'm really I'm interested in, because actually, um, when you start looking at dating memoirs and fiction, romantic fiction, these boundaries are absolutely blurred. So, for instance, some of the most famous dating columns are fictional. Bridget Jones's Diary started as an actual newspaper column, and I read that as a newspaper column, and I thought, who's this idiot? I didn't realize it was fiction when I first read it. I really, I really did. I was thinking, this, she's a right twit. How on earth did they, how did they give it? How did she get a column in a newspaper? Um, uh, Sex and the City. She's a kind of fictional um, columnist. And I noticed last week, actually, that Darren Starr, one of the writers of Sex and the City, felt that the happy ending of the film betrayed the show's core values um, in, in providing the kind of marriage and where they all end up uh, married kind of rel relatively. So we, we can sort of see the kind of tensions between the, the demand for an ending and uh, the, the demand for continuity and ongoingness. Um, these, um, the, working the other way, um, What's surprising when I started reading a lot of these um, popular women's fictions is that they, uh, the book finishes and apparently you think, oh yeah, now she's got her man and that's going to be the ending. But because they turn out to be quite popular, then they turn into a series. So actually it's not quite over and there has to be some other element, um, another man or some, another city quite often, um, which, which I'll, I'll go into. So all sorts of ways that I, that I can't go into in this uh, paper, really, um, in which these boundaries um, between fact and fiction, memoirs and stories, are completely blurred. And uh, I, I think I could show you, um, for instance, um, the, the Sunday Times has a style magazine on a Sunday, and on the back page, they have two dating columns, one by an older man and one by a younger woman. And the, the, the stories in, by the younger woman are uh, almost identical to the stories that appear in, in fictions as well. You perhaps wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Theorists have thought about this for a while. And um, what they have noticed is that um, 
Romantic commitment is associated with narrative closure. So um, the marriage plot, where the, the traditional kind of marriage plot, the 19th century novel, was obviously about one man and one woman, um, and end of story, they get married. But there are all sorts of um, popular novels now which don't want that, that closure, and um, so they, they often tend to be incredibly um, promiscuous. They talk about rela rela millions of relationships. Again, I was very, very surprised in seeing quite how much sex um, and how many, with how many different people um, appeared in these apparently kind of romantic sort of novels. <laughs> And so instead of like this working towards one relationship, you have uh, you might still have a kind of happy ending with one one person, but there've been quite a few others along the way. Um, the um, I said that um, the the term uh, chicklet um, has oh that's not what I wanted. Um, I don't know if you can really see that very clearly. It's become slightly kind of dated, um, but, 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 it's, but people have regarded it as being a very kind of um, a, a generic formula. And so um, it starts with, this is how you write your own um, chiclet. This is called Make Your Own Chiclet Novel. Um, one, start with one young urban female who's a low-level employee in, two, choose one of the following. Publish A, publishing, B, public relations, C, advertising, or D, journalism. Add anxiety about one or all of the following. A, body, B, sex life, C, biological clock, D, annoying mother, E, emotionally immature men, F, dying alone, um, uh, G, shopping addiction, H, insufficient collection of shoes, <laughs> I, Nicotine addiction, J, crappy salary, K, excessive alcohol consumption, <laughs> L, and then finding love in the city of one, New York, two, Manhattan, three, Gotham, four, <laughs> London. You know, it, it's true. They really do. There are kind of two locations for um, these chick lit novels, London or New York. Now, um, the um, in the in these in these both the sort of memoirs uh, and the and the novels, um, there are a number of similarities which I'm just going to kind of run through. One is the self-deprecating tone. There's a lot of enjoyment of comic recounting of mishaps at work or with romantic or sexual partners. So um, things going wrong is actually great for the story. And, and um, um, or, no matter how all these mishaps, no matter how embarrassing, and many of them are really quite disgusting. I'm not even going to um, tell you some of them because it's revolting and I'm a prude. Um, <laughs> they're all good material for entertaining friends. So they're all seen as being, you know, it doesn't matter if I haven't found uh, you know, my true love. I've, I've got a great story for my friend and to my friends. And uh, friendship is, as with the whole sex in the city thing, friendship is seen as extremely important in these texts, um, maybe more than romance. Um, I, will, I will say that the, um, you know, the chick lit term has maybe become a little bit outdated. Because if in the books that I've been reading, the more contemporary novels, um, there is a term which might be more appropriate, which is uh, coined by a critic called Anna Kiernan, where she talks about the slacker-slut perspective. <laughs> and it's true that there are un unashamedly promiscuous. People don't seem to be particularly worried about their alcohol consumption or their drug consumption, um, and how they manage to keep keep their jobs in uh, their low-level jobs in publishing and so on. I don't really know um, after they've drunk five bottles of wine before a presentation and so on. Um, 
they, they, use, they all use the confessional mode of address to encourage the reader to identify with them. And they celebrate the city as enabling this trinity of friendship, sex, and work. Um, so there is, there is kind of similarities between um, um, these, um, all these, these different writings. So um, this woman, Alison Taylor, um, she's a real person. Um, and um, she wrote uh, a, a 20, uh, um, uh, what was the date? 2012 um, book called The Still Single Papers, The Fearless Musings of a Romantic Adventurer Age 32 and a Half. Now, she's a, a journalist with a dating column in The Independent. And um, she seems to me to embody maybe this, this slacker slut perspective. This is the picture on her website. So I think she's probably a bit drunk there. Um, is she hitching up her skirt? Why is she doing that? I don't know. Anyway, she's certainly, um, uh, well, make your own judgment about what, what's going on there. Um, I think it's suggesting maybe she's drunk. She's maybe sexually free. Like Alan Badger, she hates internet dating. She says about eHarmony, um, the voice, similar in tone to those adverts for life insurance once you've entered retirement, um, begins if you're serious about finding love. Uh, then I got deep and lasting and shared values before switching over in a rage. Later, she says, and I apologize for this language, um, as far as I can tell, internet dating is like a really shit night out. Um, then, a couple of pages later, she has um, a section called, part what, uh, uh, called Places to Meet Men. This, this goes back to my point about buses. I got to thinking about appropriate places to pull because I find myself constantly fancying men on public transport. Bear in mind that in London, <clears throat> everybody takes the tube and it's rife with fitties. It's also rife with complications and the potential for high-octane embarrassment. She, she talks instead about you know, how you've got to meet people, sort of bump into them around the street corner. Um, she's embodying these ideas that I've said that Badger d does, um, you know, and this idea that you're going to meet your true love on, on, the, on the bus. And even if you don't and you have an embarrassing encounter, it's going to be a great story to tell your friend. So moving to the London Chicklet novel, um, uh, which early critics said um, that the, the idea of the Chicklet novel transfers very easily across um, cultural boundaries. Um, uh, however, I, I'm not so sure, judge, judging from um, these, these covers, so this is um, very, um, this is very, 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 very typical of uh, the kind of books I've been reading lately. Um, the, the covers always have the London Eye um, and um, Houses of Parliament. Um, now, the, the, these, these are um, the British and American editions of the same book. Um, this is the American one. Um, here's, a, here's a cab. Uh, there's a, uh, just like you've got here, uh, a phone booth. Um, she looks quite demure, though, doesn't she? I mean, it's the same book. Here's the um, UK one, the British one. You can see her knickers. Now, um, if you were to... Um, you might be surprised if you were to read this book. Within about three pages, Gorman's protagonist, Hannah, has sex with a man that she meets in the pub. And then later on, she and we, the readers, discover that he's married. Um, oops. Um, there's a, there is a, I can't tell you, there is so much sex in these, in these books. But I'm not, the, the point about the translation across um, uh, cultural boundaries, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I don't know, you can maybe answer that more, more than I can about US versus British tastes. Um, but I want to suggest that um, uh, within this kind of genre, this massive genre of the sort of London chick lit novel, let's call it that loosely, there are kind of two types. One of them is a sort of insider 
type, which is perhaps for, for, for those young women in London who are working in those um, careers or, or, or fantasize about that kind of um, employment and situation. And then, and then the other is um, for um, uh, much more like a, a guidebook um, about the cities um, and, and the places to meet men within them. Um, in, um, this, in this novel, um, she, she talks about real places, real pubs and things. They go to real pubs. And she, she talks about um, the locations in London as character traits for her men. So, for instance, she says things like, Rugger Robbie was a classic Fulham rugby boy, easygoing and actually very sweet. And then, I met Artie Jonathan one night in Cafe Kick in Shoreditch, which was cutting-edge indie cool at that time, rather than yuppie indie cool, as it is now. Um, so, um, there, there, are, there are very specific kind of London locations given with very specific types of men connected to those places. Um, then there are these um, uh, books which function a bit more like a kind of guidebook. So, um, in um, a novel by a woman called Lindsay Kelk, which has a, a similar kind of cover, it's called, I don't know if I've got this here, I Love London. Oh, yeah, I Heart London, sorry, I Heart London. Here we go, yeah. Um, there's Big Ben. Uh, umbrellas seem to feature as well. I hadn't really noticed that quite so much. So, um, that novel, um, in, the, in the back of it, it actually has, uh, the, the main character is called Angela, and there is a, actually Angela's Guide to London at the back. And if you go onto Amazon, you'll see that um, people have, have read it almost like a, a guidebook. This book is set mainly in London, so reading this on the run-up to me going away to London for the weekend was a winner, as it gave me so many ideas of where to go and got me really excited for my trip. Angela's Guide to London is at the end of the story. I, I love London, and it's the second of the locations Angela has visited that I've also visited. So, this, so cust readers are actually reading the books as kind of guidebooks. Um, it's, that is one of the worst books I've ever read in my life, by the way. And I don't trust a judgment about places to go in London either. But all these books have these very, very similar themes. Um, and they celebrate the chance encounter within, within London. And I want to just conclude um, by talking about another um, contemporary novel, um, popular fiction, which indicates to us how much we've absorbed, the readers of these novels, how much we've absorbed about this idea of meeting your true love um, by chance on the bus. Um, I've said that um, Badge is concerned about risk and about removing risk and that we need risk to find true love. But popular women's fictions, these uh, romances, um, they surely rely on a sense that there's going to be no risk. We, we read them because we know the character is going to end up with the right person. Uh, we, we hope that you know, that's, that's why we're reading them. If we wanted a, um, a more risky read, we'd read uh, proper literature. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a 2015 novel by a woman called Paige Toon, who's written lots of contemporary women fiction, women's fiction. And it's called The Sun in Her Eyes. It's about uh, a woman called Amber. Um, and she's already married. Uh, and her, her relationship with her husband, Ned, doesn't seem to be going very well at all. So unfortunately, she also loses her job. And her father has a stroke. So she goes to Australia to look after her, him for six weeks. That's where she grew up. And while she's there, she gets back in touch with her first love. Now, all the way through the novel, um, Ned, the husband, seems to be inattentive and he's neglectful, whereas Ethan, her first love, um, is, is very attentive. And as the readers, 
you know, we, we really think, you know, as a reader, we really think that she's going to get back together with Ethan, the first, the first love. That seems right. Um, however, in, pe on page, sorry, on, in chapter 24, and I'm just going to step outside of the plot description <coughs> to tell you that as a, as a narrative theorist... I think about the distribution of information in a novel. Where does it come? Um, and this is really crucial for our um, uh, suspense in this novel, um, that this information doesn't come till chapter 24. It could have come at the beginning, but it comes at chapter 24. Um, we discover that Amber and Ned uh, met... Um, uh, this is, there's a flashback which describes how they met. There was a problem on the underground. That happens. They had to get off and, oh no, get on a replacement bus, a crowded bus. And when she gets on the bus, she sees this man reading uh, one of the Twilight novels. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, apparently, this is a, a great conversation point, um, and, and they kind of get together. And from that point on in the novel, we know as readers that, in fact, Ned is going to come good. It's going to be OK. The relationship, Ethan can go to... Because we know enough from all our other reading that if you meet on some form of London transport, you're going to get your happy ever after. The end. <laughs> Sorry, I went on too much. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Tori. I just wonder where all the handsome men were on public transport when I lived there. I, I really, I really miss out on something. But, um, but that's not an actual question. That's just a rhetorical question. If you had any questions for Tori, we've got time to take a couple, and then uh, we'll let her rest and have a glass of wine and. Uh, if, you're, uh, if she's feeling generous, you can have a chat to her afterwards. But if there are any questions, I'll hand back over to Tori for uh, any of your questions um, now. Yeah? So, so uh, chick lit is something that I haven't heard before. And maybe oh, you haven't? OK. So is that like just girl literature? Is that what that's short for, or is it what? Um, so, so chick is a, is a derogatory term for, for women. Yeah, is that the same in yeah? So it became um, it it became it was particularly associated with things like Bridget Jones's Diary. So it was it was novels written around about the the, ter the millennium, really, sort of the end of the nineties and the two thousands. And it was um, as as the um, chart described, it was romantic fiction, which was definitely urban, and it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't sort of. Um, uh, I can't think what the American equivalent is. The, there's a British publisher called Mills and Boone who do very romantic sort of doctors and nurses type stuff. Um, this, is, this was a bit more comic and it was a bit more um, celebrating sort of female friendship. And so it, it was a term that was used in a slightly derogatory way to refer to these very specific sort of urban um, uh, novels. Um, uh, then, since then, people have felt that it's been used too widely to refer to any novel by a, a woman that's popular, and that some of the sort of popular women's fiction uh, isn't about those things. So it's, it's a slightly um, unfashionable term now. And then people did start talking about dick lit after <laughs> chick lit, um, to see if there were the same sort of popular novels written about men's friendships and so there are a few dick lit authors but um uh not so many yeah. definitely throw in a question if i'm not speaking for anyone else well i suppose according to that formula where if there isn't risk then the the love isn't as exciting as a reader i suppose the problem with those romantic novels. Uh, I mean, I used to consume them as a sort of early, you know, as a teenager, and then I definitely hit a point where I knew the formula so well that they, they ceased to be 
fun. How does that how does that risk formula sort of play out in literature? And do, is it does it kind of contradict that to some extent that so many readers turn to a predictable formula to to read about love? They, um, I think what happens is um, uh, the uh, t two things, bro broadly speaking, off the top of my head. One is the idea that um, actually the, 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 the gesture of, in, in the stuff that I've read recently, the, the, the person that they get together with, as with the last novel I mentioned, the person that they're meant to be with, who they're going to live happily ever after with, barely gets a look in in the novel. And so, actually, in the novels, they, they, are, you, they are incredibly promiscuous. There's all sorts of other encounters, sexual and romantic encounters going on. So I think they've, they've introduced a degree of uncertainty. And then the other thing is that really quite often, and you can tell that this is just a kind of marketing gesture, with the actual fictions, they, um, even though they, uh, they get together with their partner at the end, they'll manage to introduce some kind of uncertainty, leaving open uh, a, a, the next one in the series. And quite often, by the time you read the actual book, they've already um, published the next book. When they, when they get new writers now, you, they, don't, you, they don't say, oh, right, write me one novel, right, I'll publish it. You, they write me three novels, I'll publish it, and I'll publish the first chapter of the next novel at the end of the one that you're reading. So they introduce some uncertainty at the end. So though you're, on the one hand, you're getting a satisfying, happy ending. There's also something might go slightly wrong, so you've got to read the next book to find out. But then the other format is that they are more and more adopting the kind of life-writing memoir type. And so what they have is uh, a lot of diaries and a lot of lists. There are loads of books which are called things like I Followed the Rules or The List. And so they impose a kind of structure which gives satisfaction to the reader um, because the list has to come to an end. Um, uh, but it's not following a kind of conventional, you know, boy meets girl sort of thing. I mean, this means I can start reading them again. You can, yeah, you can, you can, absolutely, yeah, you can. They really vary in um, quality as well. Um, some of them are quite good, but some of them are just excruciating, <laughs> really bad, yeah. Do we have any more questions, or shall we end on an excruciating? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think perhaps it's time for a, for a wine and chat, so if you could just join me in a last round of applause. Hmm. For